Hey Photo World, if you were unable to attend last Wednesday's webinar, there's actually another one coming up on August 19th. Be sure to go to TakeAndTalkPicks.com, hit the webinar tab, and sign up today. TakeAndTalkPicks.com, I am Rob Kruger, and this is episode 60 with our Fundamental Fridays. Hey Photo World, this week I'd like to talk to you about Aperture for our Fundamental Fridays. Uh, last week, if you remember, we went over a shutter speed, and the next week we're going to be doing ISO to wrap up our exposure triangle. But for this week, we're going to go over aperture and even a little bit of how it can correlate with shutter speed, and then venturing in a little bit to depth of field. But we will have an episode completely devoted to that in a few weeks. So let's get going here. For aperture, the best way I would describe it, just with my own words here, the aperture is the opening in a lens. Apertures are made up of multiple metal blades, making a circular and adjustable opening within the lens itself. This opening determines how much light is able to pass through the lens. Apertures are listed in f-stops or f-numbers. These numbers are to represent the opening of the aperture. Aperture also plays a major role in depth of field. The smaller the f-stop, the larger the opening, and the shallower the depth of field. The larger the f-stop, the smaller the opening, and the longer the depth of field. So just like with shutter speed, I pulled off a strict, more textbook definition and wanted to share it with you, Photo World, just so it's another simplified way of looking at it. Aperture refers to the opening of a lens's diaphragm through which light passes. It is calibrated in f-stops and is generally written as numbers such as 1.4, 2, 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, and 16. It goes on from there, 22, 32, 45, 64. Most of your lenses probably hit up to at least 22. Some go to 32 for you. Um, but there was even a club once called F64 based on that long depth of field for a very small aperture all the way at F64. What are these things? F numbers and apertures, they do go together, but what does it exactly mean? Well, the F number is just the numeric value that we represent to the opening of the actual physical portion, the aperture itself, those blades opening and closing to create that circular diaphragm. And if you look here, if you're following along on YouTube or if you're just listening on the podcast, you can always go back to the YouTube channel and check it out for Take and Talk Picks. Of course, I have it in the show notes page for you on TakeandTalkPicks.com. Just type in aperture in the search bar. You'll get right to it. But anyways, aperture, starting out here, a very open aperture, a very highly sought after aperture for prime lenses that people want to go with is f1.4. If you follow along, that is very open. It is wide open. And we start saying a fast lens kind of begins around 2.8. So if it's a smaller number or a larger opening than f2.8, it's considered to be a fast lens. Fast because there's a lot of light pouring through the lens, which in turn means your shutter speed can be faster and therefore a shorter duration for capturing the picture. So a fast lens really doesn't relate to the aperture as much as it relates to the shutter speed of what actually makes it a fast picture. We go in full stops here from f1.4 to f2, f2.8, and then we get to the more medium and slower apertures, f4, f5.6, f8 is where it starts to really slow down, f11, f16, f22 is what I have on the diagram here to show you what's happening inside your lens, what's happening inside for that, that aperture opening. It's closing down, it's getting smaller, and if you look at the sizes, it's hard to tell because our eyes deceive us. But the actual area of that circle being displayed for the opening is either half or double in size depending on which way you go. So when we go from f1.4 to f2, it doesn't look like a huge difference, but it really is cutting out half the amount of space that could be passing light through, therefore losing an entire stop of light through our lens into the camera. Same thing going from f2 to f2.8 or f2.8 to 4. You know, if you jump up to f11, that's another three stops from f4, you know, 1 to 5.6, 2 to f8, 3 to f11. It's a very difficult thing to remember how it all works, but you do have to commit it to memory because the mathematics are a little bit difficult to keep in mind at all times. If you alternate apertures full stops, they are double so f1.4, skipping over a full stop here, to double it at f2.8, or you double that to f5.6. Now, it doesn't quite double when you go skipping over to f11, but it's kind of like shutter speed where we had the hiccup from 1 over 8 to 1 15th rather than a 16th. 
and then 160th to 125th, we kind of need these numeric values to settle out for us and make it a little bit easier to work with. On today's DSLRs, you'll find that when you're looking through the viewfinder, you're actually seeing through the lens at the most open aperture available. So say it's a 24 to 70 f2.8, you will be seeing it at f2.8 even if you set the aperture to f11. Once you release the shutter, then everything goes into effect. Your aperture will close down to f11, your mirror will flip up, your shutter will open and close depending on your shutter speed, and there you'll capture your picture. So back when I was shooting film, I would leave it as open as possible, compose, focus, close down to the exposure I want, and then capture the photo. Now aside from those full stops, f1.4 to 2, 2.8, 4, 5, 6, things like that, there are differences. You can set your cameras to go in half stops. So if you do f1.4, it'll go to f1.7, and then 2, then 2.3, then 2.8, 3, 4, 4, 4, 7, 5, 6, so on and so forth. There's a whole list right here on YouTube that you can take a look at uh, for this aperture video. But then most cameras, most DSLRs these days, you have the option for third stops. And I think the majority of photographers out there choose to do the third stops. So that way they have as wide of a range as they can in adjusting their exposure. I have the same thing set up with my ISO. You can do thirds of stops. You can do the same thing with the shutter speed, thirds of stops. So that way now there's a lot of flexibility in what you're going to be able to capture with your cameras. So it's just a hole in the lens. I mean, that's all this is. It's just an opening deciding how much or how little light is passing through the lens. And when we're deciding how much or how little light is passing through, we have to consider that exposure triangle. Again, shutter speed plays a role on the duration of the photo and can you affect sharpness of the image, whether it's motion blur on purpose or freezing motion, capturing that in time? Yeah, the aperture plays a role with that because it's going to decide what you're allowed with your shutter speed in correlation with the ISO. So once we get to put all these things together next week, uh, it'll be so much easier to understand how they work together. But for now, let's take a look at this little chart here. And just for those of you listening to the podcast, I'll try to describe it for you really well. It shows apertures, different settings, starting with a small aperture, therefore a large F number of F16 and full stops working its way down to the F number 2 or the opening of an aperture of F2. And below that we have shutter speeds that would be set up for a theoretical exposure. So if we're at f16 and we're at one eighth of a second, then when you open it up a little bit to f11, you therefore get a full stop to close down the time duration, which when we go from that one over eight, it moves to one fifteenth. And that is an equivalent exposure. Then you can move on a couple more stops down the line here. We open up to a f5.6 and there would have a shutter of 1 over 60, so 1 60th of a second. And then below these two little uh, diagrams of just apertures and shutter speeds that you can use, there are three images, and it's these pigeons in a park, and on one end you have that 1 8th of a second, F16, and the pigeons are flying around and they're really blurry. Well, 1 8th of a second is causing that blur. The duration of time, the shutter speed, is causing that motion blur. But you will also see that F16 seems to have a lot of things that are not moving in very sharp, clear focus. Now on the other end of the spectrum, we go to f2 with the equivalent shutter speed, for our purposes today, 1 500th of a second. And with this we see the birds are frozen in time, you know, the pigeons are you know taking flight but they are frozen in that space. But that f2 creates a very shallow depth of field. We're going to get into all this and what it means, and I'm going to touch upon it today, but for now, uh, taking a look on YouTube, you'll see that the background becomes very blurry in comparison to that F16 look. So again, when we're talking about aperture values, the F number, again, that's the numeric value that relates to the actual physical opening of the diaphragm in the lens, it does play a role with depth of field. And when we talk about depth of field, what what is that exactly? Well, you get a lot of wedding clients that come to you and they say, I want that photojournalist look. They don't know that photojournalist look means shallow depth of field. And the only reason that is related at all 
in a, a term today on Pinterest or wherever people keep finding it, is that photojournalists didn't often use flash and they needed to take a fast picture on the fly. Therefore, they needed as much light pouring through the lens as they could. And with that, they had a very open, wide aperture, say f2.8 or f1.4, and that gives us an effect a very shallow depth of field. That's the photojournalistic look. The shallow depth of field is all they really mean. So that shallow depth of field really relates to those pictures you see where there's blurry subject matter in the foreground, a really tack sharp focus person or object, whatever the subject really is about. And then behind there you have just washed out blur going crazy, just falling apart. There's no focus. It's just blending together. The colors are smearing. That's really shallow depth of field where there's those layers of blur, sharp, and then blur or just sharpness and blur, or blur and then sharpness. It's definitely different ways to do it, but the idea is that you have a mixture of both clear focus and a very small plane of focus, and then very shallow fall off, so that way it goes blurry very quickly in either direction. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have F22, a really high F number, but therefore a very small, tiny hole, a very small opening in the lens. That small opening is creating a long depth of field. Sharpness in the foreground, sharpness in the middle ground, sharpness in the background. There are still two other elements that equally play a role in depth of field, but when we're talking about aperture, the way to remember aperture is depth of field contribution. Bigger F number, bigger depth of field. Smaller F number, smaller depth of field. Okay, smaller F number, bigger aperture hole. Bigger F number, smaller aperture hole. It, it just kind of, it's the idea of capturing a negative to eventually flip it and print it to make a positive. Everything just keeps back and forth. Opposites in photography. They're all over the place. So for those of you listening to the podcast, this is a good time to head over to YouTube and take a look at the couple picture samples to follow along with, with a you know lower or shallower depth of field to a longer depth of field, and just kind of uh, describing the aperture effects and what's happening there. For those of you still watching here, take a look. Less depth of field, or as most of us will call it, shallow depth of field, F2, we have a really wide aperture. They're focusing right on that small clock in the front, and then a couple behind it just getting blurry and even more blurry as you move past. And then more depth of field, or again, in the industry, we like to say long depth of field. There's a small aperture, F16, and we can see all three clocks are in pretty clear focus. But that last one looks a little bit less sharp. Um, and, and I think that's due to a focus, focal plane issue. Now, when you're looking for the less depth of field, focus on the subject you want sharp. Everything else will go blurry the way it's supposed to. When you want more depth of field, if you have things in mind, try to look at what's the back of all of that that you want in focus, what's the front of all of that that you want in focus, and focus in the middle. Because depth of field expands both in front of and behind the subject, depending on your aperture. So let's say, for instance, we have f2.8. So 2.8 has a very shallow depth of field. You can get about a, a face in focus when you're photographing a person. And then you go to F4, you can have the entire thickness of their body in focus. But you would focus on their eye because you want to make sure that their eyes are sharp. But you can see that the front of them up to the tip of their nose is going to be sharp. Going back to their ears will be sharp. And then we start looking at groups of people. We have three rows of people, you know, five across, six across, and then another five on, behind them. And this large group needs to be clear and focused. So let's say we go for F11 to make sure they're in focus. So we focus on that front line. Yeah, they're going to be sharp, and so is the second line, but the third line might start to fall off a little bit and be a little, become a little bit blurry. But if we move to focusing on the middle line, we have the focus in the middle, and that F11 is expanding both forward and behind our subject matter. So you have all three lines in focus. And we seem to have a lot of photographers who kind of miss that in the early stages of their work. So just remember, if you want a longer depth of field, you can set up for that, but then focus somewhere in the middle of that range that you want in focus for your final image. This last slide here is just a couple more samples, and it's actually doing that three-layer thing. We have a couple people in the foreground, and we have the middle person in our whole group here is the one that's in focus. So much shallow depth of field that you can barely even tell that there's a guy standing in the background. It's almost creepy. But then when we get to that smaller aperture and, and the, the tinier hole, the bigger F number, the longer depth of field, then we start to see everybody's becoming clear. Now, again, we're getting into depth of field in a few weeks here. Let's not get too hung up on it. Aperture, really, it's an easy, easy, easy piece to the puzzle. It is the opening in the lens 
it decides how much light is passing through the lens, therefore projecting the scene onto the sensor or film that will then be decided by the shutter speed for how long it is available to see there. We're two-thirds of the way to capturing the perfect image just because of our settings are getting down with this exposure triangle. So Photo World, next week, we're going to wrap it up with ISO, put all three things together, and now we can start taking some awesome pictures. I'll see you next week. Happy shooting. We have to improve our skills. It's just the nature of the beast. We cannot stay stagnant or else we'll be left behind in the dust of the competition. Start with a 10-day free trial to lynda.com. Head over to the affiliates page on Take and Talk Picks and start improving your skills today. Takeandtalkpicks.com. Thank you again for joining us today and we really appreciate you stopping by. Make sure you share this with your friends and photo family out there. We'll see you next time. This is Rob Kruger. Happy shooting.